Now, if you ever ask anyone in their right mind if they'd like to pay their mortgage off faster and have more money to enjoy their life, surely the answer would be yes. If that's you, well, perhaps you'd be interested to know how to pay your mortgage off in 10 years, even when interest rates are going up. Because this is the exact title of a new book from best-selling finance writer, money coach, and host of the Joyful Frugalista podcast, Serena Bird, who I'm very pleased to say joins us on the Savings Tip Jar today. Serena, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Serena, for being here. Uh, we'll just talk about well, what the title of your book is essentially about and how to pay your mortgage off in 10 years. So um, how did your um, how did that come about? How did your journey to owning and paying off a mortgage result in it being paid off in 10 years? Well, it certainly wasn't straight. Uh, it certainly wasn't straightforward. And I think I probably did it in the most circuitous way uh, possible. Uh, so spoiler alert, um, I'm in my second marriage and I uh, separated from my first husband, not in the best circumstances. In fact, I took out a domestic violence order and I was a single parent for a while. Um, in our case, we had quite a few investment properties. So once we got all of that sorted out, I was actually quite lucky uh, in that I did come out with, with some assets, but we were certainly, well, I was certainly very cash strapped for a while uh, when going through that. And then I guess I sort of sat down and worked, thought to myself, well, what is actually important to me. And for me at the time, what was really important was having a roof over the head for myself and my kids. Like financial independence had always been really important to me, but that experience really solidified it for me. And I guess a lot of people with, with family can really relate to that. Well, you don't even have to have family to relate to that. It's maybe something that is intrinsic for many of us, but especially when I had young kids, I just really wanted to feel that I had that security of a home over my head and, and that security of owning it outright and never having to worry about um, negotiating with a bank or any other problems like that or a landlord or anything else. And Serena, can you tell us a bit about what inspired you to write this book and, and maybe a little bit about the process behind putting the book together? Well, I'd like to think I came up with the title, but I didn't. Um, I owe that to Leslie Williams from uh, Major Street Publishers who actually approached me. So uh, I had been in contact with her last year about another book idea and that didn't, for various reasons, come off. But, um, you know, I'm a big believer that sometimes if if things don't work out the first time, whether it's for a job or anything else, you still keep in contact with people. And I love what she, she, she does and I've had a number of her authors on my podcast. And then quite out of the blue in February, she contacted me and said, I've got this idea for a book, Serena, and I'd like you to write it. And the brief was to write it really quickly. So originally it was uh, 30,000 words, I think in about 10 weeks. And I went, yep, sure. <laughs> then did a bit out being double that amount. And, you know, I got a little bit more time, I think. So I, I can't remember. I think it was about mid-February she contacted me and I had it done by just after Easter. I don't recommend that to anyone, by the way. Uh, it, it's not a normal kind of uh, time frame, and I guess in some ways a lot of my writing was a bit rushed with this. Certainly not my sums or other things, but I'm a big believer in imperfect action. Like there's never a perfect time for anything. That said, I do feel that it was a perfect time for this message for this book. You know, a lot of people were hurting, and a lot of people are hurting even more uh, right now. In fact, I read a report today. Uh, in the, the the news about you know the amount of Australians who are under um, housing stress for, for rents, so it's not just mortgages, it's also rents. So you know, thirty percent is kind of that magic number. If you're spending more than that of your income on housing, you're really in housing stress. And I think increasing numbers of Australians are right now, and that's something we really need to recognise. For sure, and that's a nice segue into my next question. So um, I understand you bought uh, your first home, I think, in the early two thousands. Um, yeah. Do home do first home buyers in particular have it harder these days? Um, and how, like, what have you noticed? Just you know, through being an author and having your finger on the pulse a bit, um, how it was buying a home, you know, twenty years ago. It sounds crazy that two thousand one was twenty years ago, but here we are. Um, how does that differ to maybe these days? Oh my God, where have the last twenty years gone? Um, no, no, no. <laughs> it's just it's just crazy. It feels like only uh, the other day. Um, I'm not a big fan of intergenerational warfare because mm. it, it just doesn't really help people. It just You just end up feeling angry and bitter and it doesn't really help or solve the problem. 
Uh, and I was very conscious of this when I, I wrote this book. In fact, I deal with the whole intergenerational issue in one of the chapters early on. And I was really insistent that I wanted a younger editor for this book because I really wanted to make sure that I got the tone right. Because I know that particularly younger people in Australia are really sick of being told that all they have to do is suck it up and have less lattes, and have less brunches. And um, it's not really their problem. It, um, you know, other people have done it hard in their day days. So I was really conscious of wanting to make sure that the book felt really inclusive, um, but yet was also practical. I think anyone who's buying a house finds it difficult, pretty much. Um, you know, some people might be really lucky and their parents might buy them a house or they've got an inheritance and it's super easy. But for the majority of people, you know, that whole process is, is difficult for anyone, no matter what generation you are. Certainly the amount that people have to borrow these days, is much greater than ever before. It's unprecedented. Um, and in terms of looking at the affordability in terms of how much people are earning versus how much they have to pay for, that amount is also unprecedented as well. So, you know, there are certain aspects here that make it very challenging in today's environment. Um, some people really do feel like they're locked in and they're never going to, to, to get out of that. And I understand and I hear that. But just saying that it's harder today sort of doesn't tell the full story because every generation has its has its differences. And certainly there was a time when um, it might have been easier, say, for um, uh, a middle-class white male to, to, say, get a loan for a property, but it wouldn't have been easy for someone from a culturally and linguistically diverse background or, you know, a woman, especially a single woman. In fact, and it's also, yeah, like your own journey as well. Yeah, yeah. For a long time, you know, single women particularly were locked out of property. Um, and also too, you know, the, the, the revolution in, in digital finance means it's a lot easier to, you know, pay more frequently to, to shop around, to get better deals. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot more things happening. So, um, I don't think you can really compare in, in that way, but I would say that there are definitely some challenges for people today. Um, and I, I don't want to dismiss, you know, the hardship that, and the anxiety, uh, that people are experiencing right now. So, you know, one thing I quite like about your book is that, you know, it's not all about just, um, you know, living on tuna and rice and, and never going outside the house. Um, you can still pay your mortgage off quickly while still having, you know, enjoying yourself a bit. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you can have fun while paying off a mortgage? Oh, I love that good tuna and rice uh, stir fry or um, in a slice. But, you know, the reality is um, we, we can't survive like that um, forever. And I really do believe in enjoying our life while we are doing things. And, you know, I, I sort of think like, joy is a funny thing. Like what we, what gives us joy is different from other people. And it's not necessarily spending a lot of money on things. Uh, like, for instance, I've recently been doing a jigsaw puzzle that I was given as a gift. And I spent hours and hours of fun doing that, doing that. And it sort of cost me virtually nothing. So I think often we need to think about what it is that we really want to do and what actually gives us joy, um, because it's not always what marketers tell us is is the answer to that. And I guess that's the first thing. The second thing is is just to think about our friends and our community as well and think about how we connected with them, because there's a lot of research that talks about happiness, you know, coming from that. And a lot of, um, you know, community things don't necessarily cost us a lot of money. Uh, I referenced several times in the book, uh, my lovely frugal friend, Trish, who we met online about 18 years ago in a um, savings forum, actually, that we shared very sim similar frugal values. And so when we catch up, we're often talking about frugal tips. We're often sharing frugal advice. So it doesn't actually cost us a lot to do that. But that said, there are times when people do actually want a holiday. We actually do want a break. We actually do want to enjoy some some nice things. So there's a particular chapter in the book about traveling uh, frugally and how you can make the most of that. Uh, and that came about, uh, well, actually, I pushed for inclusion in this book uh, because I had had a lot of feedback after the Joyful Frugalista that I hadn't covered travel. And I think, too, like particularly for first home buyers, it's, it's when they are buying a house, it's often at that same time in their life where they're thinking, well, maybe we should travel right now before we have kids. Uh, maybe we should also have a have a wedding. You know, maybe we should also landscape. Maybe we should pay up our mortgage. There's a lot of things happening. So if you're saying, particularly to young people, you know, you should never travel because you've got this house. Um, you know, it's sort of, it, it doesn't become much fun then, does it? You're like, well, you know, it feels a bit like you, your house becomes a jail rather than an enabling uh, place of love and joy. 
certainly don't want our homes feeling like a jail strainer. Um, <laughs> but um, that kind of feeds nicely into the next question. So um, there's probably a lot of young would-be home buyers listening to this or at least reading your, your book, uh, due for release soon, um, that are kind of maybe single or they've only found, you know, love maybe a bit later in their life. You know, they haven't married their high school sweetheart. They're, they might have spent their early 20s traveling or buying a nice car maybe or having a nice holiday. Um, but what, what would you say is generally um maybe like a more um realistic scenario should um should they wait till they find the right home and save up more continue saving for you know god knows how long with a partner or or, you you know um wait for some more money to come through or should they just get their foot on the property ladder um what's what's the better sort of method and certainly what has it been like in the last 10 years or so yeah great question and you know the trends have really changed like when we bought our first house that the sort of trend was towards doing up houses like uh my first property uh my ex-husband and I bought was in 2000 and 2001 I was going to say 2003 but I think it was actually 2001 um but in the 90s you know renovating was a big thing I mean I know it is now too but it was you know more of that fixer upper rather than necessarily making things super 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 glam and that was kind of the trend really that you 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 Mm. bought somewhere pretty ordinary and then you sort of upgraded and you upgraded and upgraded but, you know, in recent years, particularly the last 10 years, there's the trend now is for people buying their forever home. And, you know, I guess there was that part of me, and it's probably generational, who sort of thought, Ooh, you know, why wait for your forever home? You know, why not do it tough and, and have that place out in the sticks that needed a lot of renovation, you know, put a bit of effort into it and, um, you know, do it up. But I can sort of see... Um, the benefit for both. And I know that probably sounds a bit bit hedging, but I can sort of see that when you're moving all the time, there's a lot of costs involved. There's, you know, all the removal costs, um, you know, there's all the, you know, the cost of stamp duty, there's agents fees. And I think those sort of fees are getting increasingly expensive too. Um, you know, as housing prices go up, you know, a lot of these things are done by percentage. So, you know, the, the costs of moving around are actually quite getting quite difficult. So that model, I guess, that we used to see um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, sort of upgrading um, is is actually getting harder and more expensive to do. It's not impossible, but it is getting harder, harder to do. Um, and I guess too, people becoming more conscious too about as they have um, families of wanting to be in a community and not moving around all the time to actually sort of stay put uh, and 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 put down those those roots. So I think you know there is a little bit. Uh, it really does depend on where you are. I personally do worry about some younger people who are getting into very large debt to buy large forever homes. Um, and I feel sometimes that that then means that you have people working very long hours so that their furniture can enjoy living in a life that they would enjoy because they're never home unless they're working from home uh, to sort of enjoy that. And and that can be a, a bit of a trick. Um, there is certainly a lot of value to be had if you are handy and can do up a place. Uh, so I think you know, for me, I prefer to live somewhere that's not as expensive, particularly for a first home. Um, and noting the importance of, of compound interest and how it works too. Like if you've got a smaller principal amount to deal with, you're not going to spend as much on interest in the long t- long run. And that's something really important to think about. So that's a very long-winded answer, but I guess I kind of am more in favour, and this is probably generational and, and, and um represents my back my background I'm more in favor of starting small paying down a lot of debt and then building on on from that where possible and Serena this is a bit of a you know on a similar theme but um, there's a bit of a trend lately that we've been hearing about um, particularly among younger generations that just feel like the the housing dream is, is just becoming so out of reach that they're what they're what they're calling it uh, quiet quitting the housing market yes. where they're just basically giving up the dream completely and just thinking up nah, it's too out of out of reach. I'm never going to afford a home of my own. Uh, I'm just going to live it up now and not worry too much about that stuff. What uh, what do you make of that? What messages do you, would you have for people who are quite quitting the dream? Well, I guess there's two. You know, one is that the sort of dream of home ownership in a major capital city is becoming quite difficult. But what's really exciting is that the ability to have remote working relate um, remote working arrangements. I've met that we've got a lot of young people coming into rural areas now and regional towns. And I think this is really fabulous. Like for a long time, it was the other way. 
that young people were, were flocking to bigger cities, but now we're starting to see people coming back. And it's um, a really positive thing, I think. It reflects uh, different values to amongst younger Australians who are really increasingly in value, valuing the environment, sustainability, community and family. Um, and these are very uh, exciting things. So I guess that's uh, the first thing. Uh, then the second thing to consider too is it's not just about owning a house. It's also about your long-term financial situation. Like you don't know what's going to happen in your life. Like um, my my lovely husband, he had a major heart attack five years ago. And now thankfully he was able to go back to work. But, you know, we would never have thought that he would have had that in his 40s. And I know people who are quite young in life have ended up that they're not able to work or they've got caring uh, responsibilities for extended family that they hadn't thought about. So it's very risky when you have, you know, the attitude that because I can't buy a house, I'm just going to go out and spend money because like you just don't know what's going to happen. And you might not want to be in that job all your life. Like, you know, the amount of times that workplaces become toxic and then you're stuck there because you have no savings. So I think it's incredibly empowering when you're in a good financial situation because it means you can, you, you've can you got choices. There's things that you can do. So it's not just about the house. It's about the broader picture about your financial situation. Uh, so without giving away all your secrets, what and tricks can would-be home buyers expect in in this book that's coming out soon? Um, and how was it writing a, a book, you know, sort of post-COVID, coming out of COVID? And, you know, thank you. So there's broadly three parts to the book. So the first part, part is dealing with the scene setting about, you know, just actually how much you have to pay and um, mindset and some financial tips and tricks. Um, the second part is probably uh, what most people would expect to hear from me. And that's a whole section um, around about um, frugal um, tips and tricks and hacks and so forth. So it covers everything uh, from cleaning hacks to transport to, you know, various other things. And I'm very proud that there's a lot of new things in there that I've never covered before. The last part of the book is a little bit different because it, it includes actually a whole chapter called When Shit Happens. So it's not just dealing with how to pay off your mortgage, but, you know, invariably you probably have a friend or a relative who is going through hard times and it really will give you tools for how to talk to that person, how to help them, where to direct them. Or if you yourself are having problems, because let's face it, we're living in very uncertain times, so you never know kind of what's going to happen. Um, there's also advice about what to do after you've paid off the mortgage, whether or not you decide um, that you want to keep your mortgage line open or whether you want to discharge it or not, what other sort of financial goals you, you should have. So it's a three-part in the book. And about writing it post-COVID, yeah, it was interesting because so much of our life has changed now. And um, I really had to reflect back when I wrote The Joyful Frugalist. It was in 2018. You know, some of the things that I wrote there were no longer as relevant. I mean, you know, for instance, transport is important, but we've got working for home um, options now. Um, a lot of how we shop um, has changed as well. There's much more of a trend towards online. There's been supply chain issues. There's a whole range of different things and considerations. Um, and even one of the things that took me by surprise is, you know, traditionally when we talk about things like transport, you talk about the depreciation costs with a vehicle. Um, usually you buy a car and it depreciates rapidly. But guess what? During COVID, the price of a lot of, of vehicles actually yeah. went up. So then it's a whole different thing. Yeah, not about making a loss if you, you, you sell a car, but how you might actually make a profit. So there were a lot of things that had changed. Serena, I'm afraid we're just about out of time. But just before we jump off, though, I'd show our viewers. Uh, this is the book. <laughs> Uh, how to pay your mortgage off in 10 years, which I believe is on sale tomorrow. So exciting times. Um, yes. as 25th of July, for everyone. Yes. yes, 25th of July for those who are listening <laughs> to the live podcast. Um, Serena, really appreciate your insights. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Savings Tip Jar. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Serena. So yes, that was best-selling finance writer, money coach, and host of the Joyful Frugalista podcast, Serena Bird, who uh, has a new book out called How to Pay Your Mortgage Off in 10 Years, and then in brackets, even when interest rates are going up. It was a great chat, Has? Yeah, it was great, actually. And I like what she said about, you know, um, there's all this talk about you get a mortgage and all of a sudden you're a pauper and you, you, know, you can't go out and you get a vitamin D deficiency because you can't afford to go out and not eat anything but do it at noodles. Tuna and rice. Yeah, and I like what she said. Everyone's like definition of joy is different. Like if you're, you know, she said that she completed a jigsaw puzzle and that's, you know, that's nice as well. Um, and that book actually comes out. So at 
today in the time of recording, which is um, Tuesday, the 25th of July. Um, join our book club. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so don't forget as well to um, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, uh, and uh, what else do we usually say? Has uh, Inquiries. Oh, yeah, that's it. Don't hesitate, don't hesitate to, direct. to get in touch. Send all your hate mail to Harrison, but send all the good stuff to inquiries at savings.com.au with an E. Uh, and thank you, Has. Thank you, Doc. Cheers. Bye. Bye.